So, lots going on, lots to get through this evening. Dan, I know you watched the Panorama investigation last night into Daniel Kinnan. It was an excellent piece by Donald McIntyre. Huge amount of work has to go into getting a piece like that to air, and they were working on it for uh, months. It would seem that Tyson Fury uh, thanking Daniel Kinnan way back when, last summer, prompted the investigation as much as anything. Panorama packs a punch, has a big audience, global impact quite often. It's been running since the 19... Uh, 50s. So really the point to make, I think, about last night, Dan, is that it was aimed at the millions who've never even heard of Daniel Kinahan or MTK. Yeah, exactly. I think it was Dara McIntyre, the reporter, just to give him, uh, to give him credit. I've but, been calling him Donald uh, all day. Dara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Donald is also an investigative reporter. I think that's the, the confusion. I, I don't Good know man. if there's a relationship there. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah, listen, I mean, I watched this. Um, I, I, I'm obviously conscious that people who um, have covered the story and some people who participate as, in it, I think, are probably quite sensitive to the viewpoint of people saying they didn't learn a whole amount from it. Now, all you can do is honestly say what your view was when you were watching it, and, and that was possibly my view. But that's because I've consumed a lot of material on this, and I, I know the story, and you know, I live in Dublin, and I'm not oblivious to... So I suppose what the the Kinnahans mean, and and listen, that's just a, that's just people asking you for your opinion of the show. Um, but you pitched it completely perfect there. In some respects, the, the views of people here about the show are sort of irrelevant, in the sense that this was about bringing it to a wider audience. You know, it's about bringing it to um, people who maybe uh, aren't curious about it or. Uh, weren't aware of it, or as you say, maybe only became aware of it in the aftermath of, um, you know, the, the Tyson Fury comments. And it, it appears to have stimulated a, a degree of debate. And it was a very well put together uh, piece of work, and it's an important piece of work. Um, and we'll see where it goes. I mean, it's 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 probably hard for people not to be frustrated by it. I mean, today I'm seeing like. like like, OK, I'm not a boxing fan, so I'm not hugely invested in the, 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 the future of the sport. But people who are, are obviously, this is breaking their hearts. And from a very neutral perspective, I'm just, every few minutes, I'm seeing idiotic comments from some boxer I've never heard of sort of come onto uh, the social media radar, denying what they're seeing or, you know, picking faults or having a go at Barry McGuigan or whatever. And it's 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 pretty horrific stuff. But obviously, the fear with all this is that people just get they just get so worn down by it that they just obviously tune out of the support the sport completely. And obviously, there's a massive element of that in and what's happening here. And this is obviously why some people people who care so much about the future of boxing are so angry and beaten down because they can see that this is a big part of of sort of killing um, the reputation of their sport and. Um, I don't know what you lads thought about it, but certainly that would be my my take on it. It's important, but it, it feels like, I don't like making comparisons or whatever, but it's almost like a couple of years back, people have just had it with cycling because of things that had happened in cycling. I know it's a very different type of thing. I mean, this is far more serious, really, way, way more serious, um, you know, from cheating to win a race. It's like this is, a, a you know, a, another level of stuff. But it's more the general reputational damage thing that sets in that people just tune out of the sport completely because they just think I'm done with that. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem. I had a look today on UK media just to see to what extent a splash had been made. I mean, you wouldn't want to overstate it either. I'd like it hasn't been no. stopped the press's territory. I had a flicker in various websites, for instance, say The Guardian. I mean, the leading sports story in The Guardian today was Channel 4 getting back the cricket rights, you know, and then next to it was Australian Open and next to it was NBA. And the Kinnan story was about a third of the way down the page and there was no picture alongside it, you know. It wasn't reach out and grab you. It wasn't you must read this. Uh, I the think, the BBC, though, John, yeah? No, just to be fair, and I think that there was a bigger story maybe 24 hours earlier because they, did they get a release of the documentary mm. early and I think there was some stories in advance just on positioning but no I do take your point sorry but I think you're you're probably right broadly it's but I think that might explain it a bit a bit you know? but you know it's still the fallout it's still the general public have just watched this what are you giving them the next day where are the opinion mm. pieces where are the uh, you yeah. know the, all that stuff that should go with this, a story like this BBC sports section by today okay so let's take your point I know it was maybe bigger in advance to drum up publicity but today 
it has dwindled to the fourth row of stories down. Like, and it was a BBC production, and in fairness, there's a good picture of Fury and Kinahan, and you'd be inclined to click on it, I think, but only if you're scrolling all the way down. And then, you know, I, I, the London Independent had a look. Like, it's over halfway down, it's not a big picture, and it's right next to a story about Carlo Ancelotti being pleased with some new signing or other. So it's not stop the presses, everybody, we've got to address this right now which is a bit disappointing because in two days' time it will have disappeared completely. And the overriding sense you have a day on, and uh, the one you'll certainly have in the coming days, is the ultimate problem with all of this, which is that there is no governing body to go to. So if you take Panorama, and they have done investigations into football bungs or uh, issues with FIFA in the past, the next day and for the days after, everybody knew where to go. There was a governing body to go to and say, this is not acceptable. So what are we doing to sort this out? And there's nothing in boxing. It's why, it's, it's why boxing was vulnerable to this hostile takeover in the first place. And it's why boxing is not going to be quick to get rid of this problem. Because there's just a mishmash of uh, various uh, bodies, WBO and WBA and this crowd, all these guys who sanction fights, hand out belts. And that's kind of their, their lot taken care of. And uh, that's where we are. So um, it's great work yeah. and there's more awareness. But in terms of like, how significant is this? There's a lot of people today coming on and saying, oh, this is really significant. I'd be less sure, to be honest with you, Dan. I hope I'm wrong. Well, I think the problem is like some of these panorama investigations say, and this is a horrible pun as such, and it's a, not to be, you know, there's like a smoking gun aspect to it. You know, that there's something amazingly new has been produced. But really what it is, like all this information to some degree, to some degree, and, I, and this is about bringing it to a wider audience, but like, it's been out there before in the sense that people in boxing, the, you know, the official in boxing, you know, all the people who make decisions, th this has all been brought to their attention before because a lot of them, I mean, a lot of the key people in boxing are obviously promoters and people who are, have been involved in this, you know, who, who featured in it. And they've already basically made their decision about how they, how they view this. You know, if they really thought that this was a... Uh, a really serious matter. They would have taken that action before, and a lot of people have just made their decision to to lie in that bed. Yeah, and and and, and that that point has already been reached for a lot of people. So you're waiting for like, you know, okay, I I feel like you're you know you're you're equating it with other stuff, and you don't want to be inappropriate, but you 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 see like how you say things unravel, stories unravel with other associations like not far from here and sometimes it's like a sponsor pulling out or these are things that like trigger a you know a, a domino effect uh, or sometimes it's the political world getting really really involved you know in, in a sense but there's 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 no real momentum in that direction and i think all the people who have that power have already faced their uh decision and they've decided to go the, the way that they have yeah very and, much so it was it was quite striking it is the problem it was quite striking last night uh, the extent to which it's clear MTK are now a global player and it's very hard to avoid them in the world of boxing. You have to do business with them if you want to survive and prosper. And at no point last summer when, you know, Kinahan was almost publicly floated by Bob Arum and Tyson Fury and there was the Bahrain announcement and Sandra Vaughan, met, you know, Sandra Vaughan went from MTK saying, we don't have anything to do whatsoever with Daniel Kinahan to MTK saying, well, anyone who says they're not talking to Daniel Kinahan is lying in the world of boxing. You know, it was quite the turnaround. But at no point even last summer did the WBA, the WBC, the IBF or the WBO get involved and say, let's have a conversation about what's going on here and the merits of what's going on or otherwise. Um, so, look, panoramas happened and that's, that's good, that's positive. But um, for my money, nothing has changed. Like, people are saying Barry McGuigan, it's, it's great that he came out and talked, but Barry McGuigan was talking about this in the front page of the Sunday Times several months ago. So, mm. I don't know. Richie, you were in here. I don't know if you had a chance to watch it back. The problem with it is, um, and there are actually a couple of problems with it, it, boxing now, whether you want to view it or not, and people within the sport would disagree, but it's true, it's a minority interest sport. Um, people within boxing have known what they're dealing with and who they're dealing with over the course of the last number of years, and they're not going to change things because of outside pressure that will probably last a very, very short amount of time on a, on a global scale, as you mentioned, to, to the scale that the Panorama documentary uh, is going to take things. And from the general public's point of view, like you can't make them care. <clears throat> and allied to that, there's always this sense from the public, and we see it in mentions on Twitter and texts and all that kind of stuff, is pe people just take it as read that boxing isn't the cleanest of sports in regards to who it deals with. 
So any revelation that might come from any documentary is not necessarily going to shock people um, that they're involved in, in boxing because they'll just shrug their shoulders and point towards Don King. They'll shrug their shoulders and point towards fights that were arranged in, you know, under the the guy under the auspices of despots back in the 70s and beyond. Like people, it's it's hard to make people care um, and to shake them towards a sport that they ultimately have no interest in. This is for boxing to clean up themselves. And until boxing decides that it wants to clean up its own house, there's going to be no talking to these people. And like, it's quite clear. Like, uh, you look at who on the totem pole, the boxing totem pole is actually out speaking about this. There's no one like Adam Smith uh, in Sky, people who deal with, you know, the fighters that are involved with MTK and the fighters that are allegedly involved with Daniel Kennan. None of these people are going to talk to you about it because they have their own business interests to protect and their own fights to sell further down the line. And they're just going to keep their heads down and get on with business. And we're going to be talking about this in another six months time, but nothing's going to change. Yeah. It's hard to disagree with much of that. I mean, I think the Irish, I think the Irish public do care about this story for obvious reasons, but uh, beyond that, I'm not sure. I mean, and really, you know, take an equivalent. How much would an, the Irish public be exercised if there was a, a Ukrainian man involved in organising fights with a dodgy past? How much would we really look into well, it look or get involved? I don't. Well, think but you can also look at. Yeah. Sorry, Rishi. Yeah. Yeah, from this standpoint, like you look at the goings on that they've been, and, and Kieran will probably talk a bit about this later, maybe too, that have been going on with the Amateur Boxing Federation in, in Aiba, which Irish boxers would have a lot of touchstones with because we're involved, obviously, in a lot of amateur competitions. We've quite a successful amateur background, and we have come face to face with the uh, less than clean nature of Aiba at the, at the 2016 Olympics. So th their background and the people running that organization has come under more scrutiny recently as well, but mm. there's nothing about it here because ultimately, like you say, you can't get the Irish public to care about some random Armenian lad they haven't cared about because he might be a bit dodgy in his own country. You're going to struggle to get American people to care about somebody whose reputation isn't necessarily clean. Uh, in Ireland, similarly, people in Mexico to care about it. It's a huge global sport. Yeah. And this country is a very tiny part of it. And to get people to care about the guy who may or may not be involved in the arranging perhaps of fights in a way that's hard to describe. It's a difficult story to make the wider general public care about. Yeah, I think uh, the I only would... way it might have blown up this time around would have been through the broadcasters, you know, but given what happened last summer and then the Kinahan announcement that he was stepping away from negotiations, I think in the eyes of, the eyes of Sky and whoever, that's full steam ahead for the Tyson Fury uh, Joshua fight. Sorry, Don. Yeah, no, I just said, at the same time, I would be like wary of being too downbeat and saying this is, you know, this will go nowhere because sometimes like you have to hope that enough, there's enough journalism and questions going on that, that keep pressing and pressing. But I suppose it's, what's the definition of a, I don't know, a victory on it. Like to me, like there's just an essential sadness about the whole thing. Like, like you can look at individual boxers and see some of the stuff they're posting and you're thinking, God, like you're an idiot. Like you know, you're just thinking this is incredible idiocy. And in some cases, it's it's no doubt true. But obviously, in in, in other cases, like you know, these are there's there's boxers who who believe what they're saying, or or come from backgrounds where they really need the support they've been given. And there's like a a sadness in the fact that like a lot of them are coming from the type of communities that are ravaged by, um, you know, the actions of of sort of. Uh, um, certain groups, you know, and like I, I, but there's also a sadness as well that like we've seen. Like you talk about the Olympics in 2016, um, Richie. Like we have recent Olympians, um, you know, beloved figures at a time whose legacy now is very much um, impacted by this. I mean, they're almost like their unspoken names now, mm. um, and they were like big names in Irish sport who, who've, who've gone the way that they have. Yeah, um, and and that's. Like you, you, like that. That's that's just a, a real sadness. But I mean, they've made the decision they have. Let's move on. We have Kieran Cunningham with us and Neil Richmond. They're going to join us around half past seven, and we'll hopefully tease things out with the two lads. We'll kick off the news round on off the ball and news talk. It's with thanks to Gillette. We don't just play the game; we change it. Gillette made of what matters. Richie, you're starting with Paul O'Connell. Is this going to be like the Roy Keane thing now? Is every Tuesday going to be a Paul O'Connell press conference? I sure hope so. It's kind of it's it's a little bit more entertaining than some of the ones we've had in the past. But Ireland uh, suffering their first withdrawals of the Six Nations campaign. Caelan Doris has returned to Leinster, having reported symptoms that could be associated with concussion. Meanwhile, Quinn Roo has 
been ruled out ahead of Sunday's trip to Cardiff due to a neck injury. Ryan Baird and uncapped Munster back row Gavin Coombs have both been drafted into Andy Farrell's squad and they'll now benefit from Paul O'Connell's line-out expertise. The former Ireland captain is enjoying his first Six Nations week as part of the international coaching staff. And O'Connell was in front of the media today and admitted that the invite to the coaching ticket from Andy Farrell came as something of a surprise. It probably did, Joe. It probably did. Um, yeah, I would speak to him a lot and I'd speak to other coaches a lot. Uh, I'm always, you know, I, I just find watching the game interesting and finding out, you know, even the the rugby matches that people find boring these days where there's a lot of kicking, I, I always found find it interesting trying to figure out why teams are doing what they're doing. There's generally a, a logical reason behind it. So I'd always be picking up the phone to coaches. So, um, But we hadn't ever discussed that. Um, so it was a surprise. It's great. He just brings a weight of intellect to the whole thing. So we're going to play a good chunk. I think uh, maybe 10 minutes in all. He spoke for about 13, 14 minutes. So we've whittled it down to the best 10 minutes and we'll play you that uh, just after half past eight or so. And it's a real pity about Kellen Doris. I was, I was out and about this morning and I was just listening to a podcast, the uh, Times podcast, and Lawrence Delalio was saying, uh, watch out everyone. I think the best number eight at the end of this tournament will be County Mayo's Caelan Doris, and then I saw the news that he was out. So uh, we wish him well, not least if it's to do with concussion. Hopefully his health is uh, back in order, double quick time. Uh, French government giving two thumbs up or giving two thumbs up to next Sunday? Yeah, a thumb and a half, we'll say. The French involvement in the Six Nations beyond Sunday has been given uh, the green light by their government today. They've been seeking assurances regarding player safety amid the pandemic. The French squad currently preparing in Nice in a bubble of 31 players. That's been reduced from the initial squad named by Fabien Galtier, which has suffered another withdrawal today. Hooker Camille Shah has been ruled out of their first three games. He has a calf injury. Uh, they're into the second half in two of tonight's Premier League games. In the battle of the bottom two of Bramall Lane, it's currently Sheffield United 1, West Bromwich Albion 1, West Brom, um, putting themselves ahead through uh, David Phillips just before half time. Sheffield United, the hosts, uh, putting themselves back into the game shortly after the break there. Meanwhile, uh, Wolves have completely turned their game with Arsenal in their favour in the past few moments. We'll hear about the latest goal in that game at Molyneux from Abigail Davis. And Wolves have turned this game completely on its head. Matinho with an absolutely incredible long-range strike. He couldn't have struck it more sweetly. And the outstretched Leno in the Arsenal goal had absolutely no chance. Wolves clearly buoyed by what happened at the end of the first half. They've completely dominated the start of this second. And they're looking really, really good now to get their first win in the league in 2021. There you go, Abigail Davis there. We can also hear about those couple of goals we've had so far at Bramall Lane. Sheffield United up against West Brom. Here's David Eason. Sheffield United won, West Bromwich Albion won the Blades back in this. The thin hopes of the rest of their season hanging on this final 45 minutes of this game. And they've got themselves level, levelling Matt Phillips' goal before half-time for West Brom. It's Jaden Bogle who switched to the right-hand side. He's more right wing than right wing back uh, for Sheffield United in this one. And he finished off after Chris Basham had found himself trying to find uh, uh, some way to get it past the goalkeeper in the penalty area. It came out to Bogle and he lashed it in at the near post. It's been all Sheffield United in this second second half they've been really more direct they've been using the possession that they had in the first half but really getting beyond the West Bromwich Albion back line and it's all to play for in this one Sheffield United 1 West Bromwich Albion 1 Elsewhere, Manchester United can pull level on points with leaders Manchester City, albeit with two games more played. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side welcoming Southampton to Old Trafford for May 15 and at the same time Newcastle entertain Crystal Palace We'll be talking about that right uh, through the show and most certainly on the football show. Dan, back with us again after nine o'clock. Uh, more Olympics talk. This is getting tedious. Yeah. Tokyo 2020 president Yoshihiro Mori insists this summer's Olympic Games will go ahead regardless of what the coronavirus situation is. Parts of Japan are in a state of emergency after a spike in the number of cases and the Games have already been postponed, as we know, by 12 months. But Mr Mori says they must look at new ways of hosting the event, this taking what Thomas Bach has said last week a little bit further as well. I mean, what a pointless statement to make, really. So the Tokyo 2020 resident has said the Olympics will go ahead regardless of what the coronavirus situation is. I mean, I, I doubt it. I really it's not doubt entirely, it. It's not entirely pointless considering there were reports okay. in the, Hang well, on. Regardless, there's, there's regardless of the situation that's going ahead, it's not going ahead regardless of the situation. I mean, I'm just like, you've got to report the news, but in terms of dispatches from Tokyo, I hardly think that clears everything up. 
it doesn't necessarily clear up the nut, but what they said, what was said in the papers or in certain papers last week was that the Japanese government privately had said that this isn't going to go ahead. Mm. So I think if the president of the organizing committee is coming out and without wanting to defend the guy, um, yeah, saying that the Olympics are going ahead regardless, like they're in a pretty p- decent position to be able to tell us more than we would be able to tell them whether they're going ahead. So be inclined to believe them. Uh, okay. I, I don't think anyone I'd can love- predict the situation. Sorry, Dan. I'd love to go back to last March and, and yeah. hear the news rounds from then about the various events because like, we have this absurd situation where UEFA last week are still adamant that they're going to play the Euros in 12 cities, you know, come June. So, like, in a country at the moment where people can't travel five kilometres, you know, or, or can't see family members, we're now hearing UEFA still intend to bring, like, you know, a number of teams here this summer for a major tournament and they might even have fans at it, even though we know that there may not be fans in Ireland games till September. So, like, but listen, they obviously, there's a lot of money at stake for these organisations, so they need to put out encouraging statements sometimes, but it feels like we've been here before. It does. Sorry, Richard, was it, that, that was a touch grumpy of me, but I just feel like every news right now is somebody from Tokyo saying something which is not worth very much. We've just got five more ones of a joke. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely going ahead until no, sorry, it's not. Is almost four, new, four news rounds a week, uh, five months. I think we can do the maths on this one. We're going to have somebody pretty much every day. Yeah. Jurgen Klopp, meanwhile, Liverpool in action tomorrow. Yeah, and Liverpool manager says tomorrow's game with Brighton will probably come too soon for new signings. Ozan Kabak and Ben Davies. The defenders both signed on deadline day yesterday with Joel Matip's season ended by an ankle injury, but Klopp says that both players will need time to bed into the Liverpool squad. We needed players because obviously we could play very well. Um, when was it? The other day against um, West Ham. And Tottenham in the second half when Nate and, 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 um, and Hendel played together. But our problem is always now since already since months, if one more thing happens, then we don't know really what to do. Then it's really, then, it, then we start struggling. And the solutions we found so far, they were good. But now we have again more options, and it's not perfect. That's uh, the, 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 you know that the general transfer window is not my favorite window because we, we 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 signed the players yesterday and play tomorrow night. We will see if they are available or not. That's not a problem. But then we play three days later again. So it means in a very in a in a position where where um, team um, patterns are really important that everyone knows what he's doing. Players come now in new. And Rich, before we go, a serious enough bans for two inter-county managers. Yeah, Cork football manager Ronan McCarthy and Down football boss Paddy Talley are both set to be hit with 12-week bans from the GEA. It's believed they oversaw breaches of the ban on collective team training in recent months. Cork were seen conducting what was called a team-building exercise on Yall Beach last month, while Down staged a similar get-together in Newry. Chris says, surely it's boxers that need to come out and talk about the situation. Uh, we've opened the door for lots. Uh, people aren't as keen to come on uh, as you might like, but um, it's difficult, isn't it? It's a difficult situation for lots of people in that world, but um, it's quite enough. Barry McGuigan, one of the few at the moment. Dan, we'll talk to you again on the football show. Richie, as ever, thanks a million. I'll thanks, bring you the news from Tokyo tomorrow. Yeah, well. Richie, I want you to lead with Tokyo tomorrow. Guaranteed. Uh, Joe, Joe, Donald McIntyre is Darren McIntyre's brother. I had a message about it, so there we go. Yes, are, The yes. two reporters are related. Okay, because so I knew, I mean, I was like, I was so sure. So it's it's Dara last night and Donald's brother, also a reporter. Is that it? Yep, that's okay. the one. Apologies. Um, before you go, competition time. So, uh, really nice prize. Six months, now TV, Sky Sports Pass as part of our Super Bowl uh, build-up. Look out for the Snap Super Bowl preview here on Off the Ball uh, Midday. Friday on our social channels, but uh, if you want a six months Now TV Sky Sports Pass, uh, just identify our mystery uh, voice who can't contain his excitement ahead of Super Bowl 55. Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. One more time. Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. NFL fans will know that. Text your name and answer 53106 for 30 cents. We'll contact you after the show if you've won. All with thanks to Now TV, where you can catch uh, all the Super Bowl preview shows and obviously the game itself with the Now TV Sky Sports Pass. Short ad break, and then we're talking with Kieran Cunningham and Neil Richmond next about the Daniel Kinahan BBC Panorama investigation last night.